Okay. Okay, so we start. Okay, welcome everyone to the um, seminar in contemporary Marxist theory, um, which is now a cross London endeavor. Um, we kind of got you all around here together to, today to, to we're going to have a lovely roundtable on the US elections. We were hoping possibly there would be a result, but as as we were kind of talking about when we were arranging this event, um, I did point out that maybe we should do this next week because there wouldn't be a result this week, but hey, um, we're now living in this era of we don't actually know what is happening in uh, the election in 2020, but everyone's paying attention to two states in particular, which are Nevada and Pennsylvania. So <clears throat> just to give everyone a kind of brief intro to what we're gonna talk about today, 2020 US election marks the possible re-election of Donald Trump or the possible election of Joe Biden, but in many ways is a kind of key moment in the fissures that have grown across US society, or maybe that's the incorrect way, the fissures that have grown more visible in the last decade to four years, uh, with the rise of the alt-right, with Trumpism, with the emergence of uh, liberation movements like Black Lives Matter, and of course with the other kind of crises that are afflicting the modern US society and the globe in general, which are the crises of capitalism, um, the environment's relationship to that process, and just the general rubbish nature of democracy, both in the US and across the planet. So we, we, what better kind of topic to talk about in this current moment than, than root that into the kind of contradictions that are running through the general, um, for the presidential election. So I'm not really gonna waste much time in um, kind of taking up time talking. We're just gonna have a round table, which is 10 minutes um, for each speaker to kind of give their reflections on where we're, where we're going, where we've been, where we possibly are go uh, gonna head towards in the future whether Trump will actually leave the White House or not. Um, and we're gonna do this in reverse order to what we kind of advertise this in because um, Michael Utrecht was um, quite adamant that he wanted to go first. In fact, he demanded it. So we have, we have gone into his demands. So just to give you, I'm gonna introduce uh, everyone right at the start so that I don't have to kind of do this uh, throughout. So the first, <laughs> Uh, roundtable speaker will be Michael, Michael Utrecht, who is the deputy editor of Jacobean and the host of um, Jacobean's radio podcast, The Vast Majority. He is also the author of Strike uh, for America, Chicago's Teachers Against Austerity, and the co-author of Bigger Than Bernie, How We Can Go On From the Sanders Campaign to Democratic Socialism. Um, next up will be Derricka Pennell, who is a US-based right, uh, right. US human rights lawyer, writer, and organizer, and a Guardian US columnist. Um, she works to end police and prison violence by providing legal assistance, research, and training to community-based organizations through an abolitionist framework. Um, after that will be Vijay Prasad, who is an Indian historian, the chief editor of Leftward, Leftward Book, Books, and the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Vijay has published more books than I have probably have ages and years. Um, and his most recent one is Washington Bullets, which looks amazing. Next up will be Jody Dean, who is a political theorist and professor of political science at William Smith Colleges in Geneva. Um, and she's written or co-edited 13 books and has an amazing book, which is, I, I read a couple of years, a year or so back called Comrade, an Essay in Political Belonging. And was also at a really cool conference we did together in Manchester at the People's History Museum, which was really, really cool. Um, all right, so Micah, you get to go first. I hope you embrace this going first, okay? I'm gonna shut up now. Thank you for uh, acceding to my demands. I was I was prepared to walk away. You know, I was prepared to close the Zoom window if I didn't get to go first, so I appreciate it. Uh, so rather than give a, a you, know, uh, you know, point by point explanation of uh, everything that's happened in the election and everything significant that's happened, I think I'm just gonna focus on three things and hopefully my other panelists will fill, it, fill in some other details for those who uh, are, are, are desperate for that full, full picture of what's happened in the US election. I think the very first thing to say, uh, which should be the preface for any discussion of the US political system is that the terrain upon which we are discussing what has taken place in this election uh, is the terrain uh, of, as John mentioned, the sort of fundamentally undemocratic American political uh, institutions from, from top to bottom. Uh, the only reason that we are discussing whether or not Trump 
will win an election is because we have the system, the Electoral College, that is uh, one that made Trump the president, despite the fact that he lost by nearly three million votes. The only reason that people who uh, didn't want to see Trump reelected uh, are worried that he actually could be elected is not that he, no one is worried that he lost the that, uh, that he won the popular vote. They're worried that he managed to win the Electoral College yet again, uh, despite uh, uh, losing the popular vote. And I, I say that uh, I mean I feel like the people on the left, left, leftists and liberals can't say that enough times, can't uh, emphasize that enough times, uh, because I mean, this is, it's just one of our many fundamentally undemocratic institutions. I think that those political institutions have uh, thankfully taken a hit in terms of legitimacy uh, over the last uh, few years, that it's becoming clearer and clearer that our uh, minoritarian political institutions that frustrate the will of the, of the majority uh, are, are a real barrier towards us getting to a, a more decent and sustainable world. Uh, the goals that I think, uh, despite some of the kind of grotesqueries of American politics that are broadly shared by a majority of the population. So um, my, my serious hope is, the, is that, that those institutions have taken a serious hit uh, and, and that at the very least there is a growing consensus that uh, American anti-democratic institutions uh, really need to be uh, scrapped uh, maybe we're not at the point yet where people are ready to say we need to scrap the the constitution uh but uh, we're we're making baby steps towards that direction um the second most striking thing for me is that i was someone who bought the argument that we heard from lots of pollsters uh and the professional media class that this was going to be a route that there was going to be an overwhelming uh consensus among americans that uh, you know, Donald Trump's four years in office had been a disaster, most spectacularly with his horrific and murderous handling of the coronavirus pandemic uh, that's resulted in you know, nearly a quarter of a million people uh, dying, many of them uh, totally unnecessarily. And uh, even though you know, leftists like me would make the argument that what Biden had on offer is uh, certainly not up to the task of, of transforming our country and, our, and, and the world in the way that it needs to be transformed, uh, that at the very least, people would be sufficiently horrified by uh, what they've seen uh, to to you know to vote vote the bum out and, and repudiate Trump after four years of, of madness. Um, and it looks likely uh, it's always dangerous to make a prediction, but it looks likely that Biden will uh, prevail. But I think it's clear that it's hardly with the kind of resounding mandate uh, that anyone uh, that, that that was predicted to be to that he was predicted to receive. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, there's some polling that suggests, for example, uh, that people were concerned, uh, that voters were uh, seriously concerned about their economic prospects uh, in the face of continued lockdowns. They associated Joe Biden with uh, continued lockdowns. Uh, and they didn't hear from Joe Biden or from much of anyone else within the Democratic Party uh, that they had a, uh, a, a economic, you know, economic proposals that they were going to carry out. Uh, you know, if, if Biden was in the White House, that would deal with that fundamental problem that, you know, would allow people to stay home from work by paying them a decent uh, monthly, you know, wage to, to, to do the very thing that we all know needs to be done to stop the spread of the pandemic. And so, uh, luckily, in, in my view, Trump probably won't be returning for another four years, but uh, the, the grotesqueries of the last four years clearly were not enough to deliver a, a kind of a resounding mandate for this uh, this non-agenda agenda that Biden ran on, which was basically that I am not Trump. Uh, aren't, aren't you horrified by his uh, bad manners and, and how awful he is? Uh, and then that's sort of like the extent of the pitch. And so uh, we're, we're kind of in a, a, a position that's familiar for anybody who's paid attention to the Democratic Party in recent years and decades is that we have a, a Democratic Party that really is not running on very much. Uh, and uh, even in a, at a time of unprecedented upheaval and the unleashing of all kinds of uh, really nefarious and evil and violent forces and, and the reactionary right in the United States, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, uh, even in the face of all of that, even in the face of bodies piling ever higher towards the sky, uh, who people who have died from the coronavirus, uh, Americans are, are still sort of not feeling like what the Democrats have on offer uh, is is particularly compelling to them. Compelling enough maybe to deliver Joe Biden to the White House, but not 
a, a, a compelling political alternative, which should make us very worried uh, for the uh, continued existence of, the, this, of Trump's version of this kind of reactionary populism, which may in fact take even more grotesque forms in the uh, years to come under under Biden or uh, you, you know when we have I don't know President Donald Trump Jr. running in 2024 or whatever whatever gets delivered in the in the years to come. Um, but the last thing that I will say that is related to that point is that the thing that uh, that gives me a genuine sense of hope uh, is that what sets this this year 2020 apart uh, from even the last presidential election is that there is a newly reborn left in this country. It is a left that is incredibly nascent. It's a left whose power certainly should not be overstated, uh, it, but it is a left uh, through organizations like the Democratic Socialists of America, through uh, the you know organizations like uh, the Sunrise Movement that are pushing for a Green New Deal, uh, and in a different form through obviously the incredible explosion of protests that we have seen this year, the, the, the largest upsurge in protests ever seen in American history, according to many. Uh, that there is a fundamentally different uh, attitude going into uh, this term of a centrist neoliberal president that is distinct from, you know, Barack Obama entering office in 2008. There, are, I think that this this nascent left that exists doesn't have any illusions uh, about what Joe Biden will be up to in the White House. No one believes that Joe Biden is going to carry out. Nobody, but I would say the most deluded uh, sort of centrist liberal. Uh, pundits believes that Joe Biden is going to carry out some kind of uh, bold progressive agenda that he will apparently <laughs> create from whole cloth since he has said over and over and over again in his campaigning that he will not be governing on such an agenda. This is a guy who said uh, at one point that if a Medicare for all bill were to cross his desk and it had passed, you know, in the in the Senate and the House that he would veto a Medicare for all bill. So he's made very clear that he that no one should ex expect any kind of transformational change from him, the kind of transformational change that this nascent left has been arguing for. Uh, and so uh, at, at, at the very least, I think that left is prepared on the first day of a Joe Biden administration uh, to really go into, a, into opposition to uh, a, a Joe Biden presidency that nascent left understands that that kind of opposition will be the only hope that we have for winning any kind of decent social democratic uh, provisions, any kind of uh, move towards the Green New Deal, uh, any of the anything that would uh, actually substantively address uh, all of the crises that we're facing. And so uh, it's, it's, again, it shouldn't be overstated, but it does exist. And that is where I'm, where I'm placing my hope in the, uh, in the next four years. Cool, thank you, Michael. And, and that was under 10 minutes as well, brilliant. Um, it's, it's good going first, right? <laughs> um, I think we'll, we'll keep the order going. So uh, Derricka, can you go next? Is that cool? Sure, sure. Thank you so much for the invitation. I think that some of what I offer, Micah, is sort of laid the groundwork. So I think it was a blessing in disguise that, that you went first. So, you know, Joe Biden is likely going to be the next president of the United States. I think the last time I checked, he was only a couple of electoral votes shy. And what's going to happen, maybe one point of divergence I have from Micah, I actually don't think that the most deluded centrist pundits are going to say, look at Joe Biden. Um, he's not going to deliver a progressive agenda. I think they're going to figure out how to use Joe Biden to obscure a progressive agenda or at least conflate what he's putting on the table as progressive. And I think that is going to be because there's going to be so much pomp and circumstance over him and Kamala Harris entering to those positions. And so what's going to happen is that lots of organizers, particularly organizers of color, are going to have to fight against that exhaustion of people voting and organizing underneath the pandemic an uprising against police violence and an economic crisis and gonna have to figure out how to combat this narrative of Joe Biden being sent to the White House as the person now who has received more votes than any other president in history. And so the narrative surrounding Joe Biden, the, what's lifting his wings is this excitement when actually, you know, what we know lots of people are very frustrated and very angry at Trump. And this is another way, just as we've seen the ways of protests in this country against police violence is not only against police violence, it's also against the, the presence of Trump. That does not change the fact that more than 60 million people still cast their vote for him. 
And so I think lots of Black people, people of color, people organizing multiracial formations are going to have to do on the left is play double dutch, right? They're going to have to criticize Joe Biden and hold him accountable and also not be called or dismissed as the leftists who can't get over not having a Bernie Sanders as president or Elizabeth Warren for others. And so just as Micah said around Joe Biden's commitment to condemning or at least vetoing parts of a progressive agenda, he's also has committed to give more money to the police. And one of the ways he has shown that he diverges from Trump, he points at Trump and says, you know, Trump wants to defund the police. I want to give more money to the police. You know, at one point he even considered, or at least said he was considering having a Republican running mate. This is before he picked Kamala Harris. And so this, this person who we know pre the election, um, the person who told, you know, some black people, if you don't, if you have a problem choosing between me or the other guy, then you ain't black. Now this guy is going to be, to, he's going to be the champion, the face of hope for so many people who are suffering under, you know, Donald Trump. Um, yeah, so those are just some of the challenges that so many of us are in a sterile arranged marriage. Sometimes it's a negotiated peace agreement with the Democratic Party. Sometimes it's active antagonism. Sometimes there's some level of ambiguity because we have to figure out how to get our people free, how to get resources in real time, and how do we constantly figure out how to position ourselves to get what we need from the party while also understanding that the, con the conditions, the terrain in which we organize are problematic. And so this is so frustrating, obviously, because of a two-party system. But as we see from our good colonial predecessors in the UK, it's not necessarily that having a parliamentary system is salvific either, right? So what do we do? How do we continue to organize, you know, given what I anticipate and many of us anticipate is going to be an uphill battle as we get to January 20th, right? That's what we're going to have to figure out to do. And so what I have seen people done, you know, in the last four years, and it's so funny because in 2016, I guess, 2007, 2016, I remember writing something for Vox and I said, look, people are going to continue to organize regardless of who wins. And I didn't anticipate at the time that we would see the levels of organizing and activism that we've seen in the last four years, not only in the US, but across the world, you know, South Africa, Nigeria, South America. It's been so remarkable to see the energizing and to see people be pushed or at least open to being pushed towards more radical and transformational ideas. And so what's even more exciting than that is that Joe Biden kept saying throughout his campaign that he beat the socialists. He's not a socialist, he, he, he beat the socialists. What's, I mean, I guess that's true. I mean, if, if that's what you get off on, if that's your thing, but what Joe Biden cannot be is socialism. He cannot beat the narrative around democratic socialism. He cannot, he cannot defeat the people who even voted for Trump but still voted for a $15 minimum wage or who is still an exit poll show that they were overwhelmingly in support of universal health care. So those are the things that Joe Biden cannot beat. And it's going to be up to us to figure out how to polarize people, right, to not concede to this narrative that polarization is bad for this country because there are some people that we shouldn't want to be on the same poll with. So how do we polarize and force people to cho choose a side? You know, how do we ch have people choose? Do you want to be on the side of people who are exploiting, who are oppressing? Do, is that what the kind of freedom that you want, the freedom to hurt others? Or do you want to be on the side of people who are demanding something much more visionary? And it's through that polarization that organizations, that organizers in particular, I think, can help shift the country towards something much more um, exciting. So the conversations around socialism here, the conversations around abolition here, the de-democratic experimentation with mutual aid, with mutual care, what people are deciding that we need to save our planet, not only so that we can live today, but we can you know, our generations and generations and my kids and my grandkids and my great, 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 great grandkids can have something worth being excited over, you know. And so I think the last thing I'll end with is this quote that I love from Fred Moda and Stefano Harvey. This is written in the under comments and it's a response to Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism as a metric of premature death. And so, and they say, you know, what is this thing? Like, what's the difference between what Ruth Wilson Wilson, um, Gilmore rather, sorry, is describing, right? What's the difference between this and slavery? So what is to speak of this, um, this object, this project of abolition? 
And it's not so much just the abolition of slaveries or prisons or police, but the abolition of a society that could have prisons, that could have the wage, right? This is the abolition of the society that we currently, that constitutes what we have right now. And so it's not the abolition of any particular thing, but it's actually towards the founding of a new society altogether. And that's what I think are giving people a lot of hope that whether you know, Biden enters office or whether Trump figures out some cunning way to attempt to steal an election, that people are, are trying to figure out how to abolish the society in which either one of those things are possible. And that's where my hope lies today. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and I think that that imaginary stretches on even beyond the US. We could deal with some of that in the UK as well. Um, Okay, BJ, can you go next? Yes, please. Great, that was brilliant. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, recently, there was an election, which uh, I hope the left was um, lifted by, not the election in the United States, a wretched country with wretched elections every year, but the election in Bolivia, where the people of Bolivia, within a year, decided to kick the ass of the coup government and to tell the United States that its schools are not welcome any longer in South America. Um, I think people need to start our own history through things like Bolivia, places like Bolivia. Uh, my history doesn't begin with hanging chads and with contested ballot boxes in Pennsylvania. It begins you know, with people like Patricia Arce, who had red paint thrown on her and gasoline. They cut her hair in the streets of her town where she was the mayor. She looked at the camera and said, we are not afraid, and then was elected in this election as a senator. Um, you know, I mean, people like Patricia Arce begin our history, uh, not, not uh, you know, the misery that one sees inflicted um, in, on the people of the United States. And this should be a reminder that the next time the United States decides to go and bomb a country to bring democracy, that the world stands up and says, we don't want your democracy, you know, anywhere. Uh, we don't want your democracy promotion in Libya. Uh, first, why don't you try to do it in the United States before you export it elsewhere? Now, some observations. Um, the first observation, landslide. I mean, people who talked about landslides are blind to the fact that the United States is so deeply divided now, entrenched divides, uh, divides of region, forget about race and etc. divides of region. Um, there are at least two countries inside the United States. You know, the very fact that there's such a thing called a swing state means that, you know, whether the swing states are Pennsylvania or Florida, three or four states, the bulk of the states are not swing states because they're entrenched in a certain view. Um, this view has become cultural and there is a cultural divide. When the right said, um, about 20, 30 years ago, there is a cultural war afoot. No, it actually wasn't a cultural war that began then. It's a leftover of the civil war because the United States is a curious place. It's one of the few places where the so-called loser of a war erected statues to their generals and their political leaders in public squares. I mean, I've never seen a loser of a war erect statues. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I've never seen losers of a war. I mean, imagine, um, you know, in, in Germany after 1945, having statues of Himmler and having statues of Goering and so on across the German public square, not in the privacy of some nutsoid Nazi's house, but a big statue in a public place. That was the end of the US Civil War. In a sense, there was no end in 1865. It continues. There are entrenched divides in the United States. Some of these are class divides that have been in a way morphed into culture and in that typical way that class manifests itself, never perfectly, but it's morphed and crushed into all kinds of cultural formations that need a lot of analysis to disentangle. Landslide, it's impossible to have a landslide. You know, the Reagan landslide of 84 can't be replicated in, in this kind of context now. I really very much doubt it. You have a permanent situation where the electoral college will go 
one direction and the popular vote will go in another. This is not the first time it's happened. It happened many, many occasions in the last, I think, five or six elections, election cycles. So that's the first observation. Second observation, this was a lockdown election. I mean, it seems to me, looking at the exit polls, that one of the principal issues was the impact of the lockdown. Now, this suggests to us the utter failure of the advanced capitalist countries to deal with this pandemic, to be prepared for this pandemic. You put a line by line comparison between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America, there's no comparison. Um, in the People's Republic of China, very, very fast, they you know, closed down Hubei province, they broke the chain of the infection as much as possible, um, and then soon thereafter, the economy, you know, started up again. In fact, the IMF World Economic Outlook report suggests that next year's modest growth, that is in 2021, they say that China is going to account for 51% of total GDP growth next year. That's incredible. I mean, this is a direct line comparison. So I don't actually blame people who are frustrated saying, I don't want to wear a mask. I mean, theirs is a corrupted critique of the fact that their capitalist system is totally failed. You know, they don't have a clarity, but they are right. They are frustrated. What the hell? I mean, are we on permanent lockdown for two years? What's going on here? I agree with them. They are frustrated and angry, but there is a way in which class and the language of class becomes to this, comes to the surface. It's never in a good way. It's always in these kind of bizarre, odd ways. And again, we have to disentangle. We, we can't just say, oh, these people are morons. They don't agree to science. That that's a very elitist attitude towards people. They have a very contorted idea of what's going on. You have to disentangle things. You have to come in, with, in there with a better argument instead of contempt. So that's the second observation. I'm trying to get through, through these as quickly as possible. Maybe I'll only do three. This is the third observation. Um, you know, let's face it, guys. Whatever we call it, liberalism, neoliberal, social democracy, whatever you call it, it's totally exhausted. I mean, there's no agenda. The Democratic Party in the United States can only come up with the basic um, electoral slogan of, I'm not as bad as that guy. I mean, it's not just Trump, okay? Face it, in contest after contest, in divided, ele you know, the contest against Mitch McConnell, his uh, opposition, it was all about saying McConnell is horrible. You know, McConnell is Trump. You can't run elections like that if you don't have an agenda. What's the project of American liberalism? Seems to me nothing. I mean, I think uh, Derek is quite correct, you know, uh, oh, he's actually not good for the police. I'm better for the police. Or as we see in India where the Congress party keeps saying, you know, what the BJP is doing now, we are the ones who said we'll do it. I mean, that's not an agenda, guys. You're not different. Then people say, well, let's just go with the authentic right. Why go for this useless right? Let's go for the real right. I mean, if, if you're going to fund the police, go for these guys. They're really going to help the police, you know? Why go for this sort of soft right? So they don't have a project. What's the project of social democracy or liberalism? Or again, whatever the hell you call it. In this case, the Democratic Party. I mean, in the UK, what's his name? Sir Kerr or whatever. I mean, it seems like his project now is just to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. I, I don't know what his project is. I mean, does he have a project for the country? You know, anti-Brexit is not a project, by the way. Just, just for your information, uh, anti-Brexit people. Anti-Brexit, that's not a project, you know? That's just anti-Trump in England. It's the same sort of pathetic, no politics politics that doesn't win you the imagination of people and so on. So that, that exhaustion of, of social democracy is a confounding thing. Look at Brazil and India right now. In India, Mr. Narendra Modi won an election in 2014 and was re-elected in 2019. That should give pause to people who think you see a monster in office once, then people come to their senses and don't re-elect them. Sorry, he was re-elected. I looked at the polling data um, for Bolsonaro. Polling data for Bolsonaro in Brazil is extraordinary. In December, um, here's the number. In December, he polled excellent People called him excellent. 29% called him excellent. This month, guys, after the catastrophe regarding COVID-19, Bolsonaro's excellent rating is up to 41%. Um, you know, he won 55% against Hadaj to win the election in 2018. They say if there's an election today, Bolsonaro will win. 
you know th that's where we are th this is the situation because the other side is exhausted they don't have a project the left has a project and i quite agree with both micah and with derica the all the dsa nominated people won but where did they win micah which part of this regional divide did they win in they won one side of the regional divide the problem is how do you capture people in the other side and that's a that's that should be an enduring issue for the left how do you go into those areas where there's entrenched anti communism which trump appealed to he hit that hard when i when he first started giving this anti communist speech i thought this is anachronistic like what's he up to but they knew what they were up to they were going for specific pockets of people delegitimizing you know the democrats in general and so on it was perhaps shrewd in the end because in miami dade it seemed to have had an impact so finally the left has a role to play here but i think we also need to encourage uh, people who are in the trend of left liberal and liberal to wake up a little bit it's not enough for them to sit and drink their morning coffee and sniff at the world and say i don't know what's happening it's a catastrophe i don't understand my neighbors i think you better take a walk down the street and talk to people it's not enough to just talk to the woman that comes in to clean your house you may need to go out there and talk to people it's not enough to listen to nate silver's garbage election cycle after election cycle believing some fantasy poll take a walk go and look at the slums inside of america because they exist thanks a lot thank you vj um brilliant as ever um and finally um and taking mike's role as the last person um jody dean please go ahead uh, thanks so much um one of the benefits or burdens of being the last speaker is a lot has been said um a lot that i agree with but i want to begin with um just a description of the election and the context and the way i see it is that we had a desiccated career politician with 47 years in office running a campaign that eschewed large scale rallies and for for you know for went um door to door canvassing and it was unable to deliver a resounding defeat of a tax evading real estate mogul responsible for the deaths of over 230,000 Americans in the worst response to the coronavirus on the planet in an election that cost over 14 billion dollars the electoral college system and um Mike already um, talked about this right this means in the US that the popular vote doesn't determine the election it means that we do not have a one person one vote system but votes in Wyoming say are worth like two or three times more than votes in Florida the democratic party puts more energy into defeating left insurgencies in its own party than it does into defeating its ostensible opponent the republicans the democrats even though they're supposed to be an opposition party in fact reject policies popular not with their own base but with the entire country right medicare for all um even green new deal and instead the democrats um promise to be good republicans reach across the aisle work with their opponents the supreme court has a very conservative majority thanks to the openly political and rushed confirmation of amy comey barrett The federal judiciary has been filled with hundreds of Trump of Trump appointees. Congress looks to remain deadlocked, um the Democrats un unable to secure a clear majority in the Senate, and this is um in part because they support lackluster mainstream candidates instead of progressive insurgents. And this was particularly significant in Kentucky where the Democrats went all in to defeat a progressive in the primaries who actually stood a chance of beating Mitch McConnell, you know the the ruthless Turtle Lake Senate majority leader. Now exit polls point to a highly polar um polarized electorate. I mean we've already been talking about this some today, but um one of the wild things is that on the question of the most important quality in the president, 76 of the 76% of those who said uniting the country voted for Biden and only 23% for Trump. This is not surprising. Conversely, 71% of those who valued a strong leader voted for Trump and 28% for Biden for Biden. Voters are at polar opposites in their assessments of each candidate with respect to handling or likely handling of the coronavirus, the economy, and they're utterly polarized with respect to the approval of the current president. 
There's similar polarization with respect to the question of how people would react if the person they did not vote for won, with strong majorities saying that they would be concerned or scared if the other guy won. In recent weeks, even the most mainstream media in the US has been broaching the question of whether we are in or headed to civil war. And of course, when the dynamics are those of civil war, strong is going to beat weak, right? Political strength and possibility is gonna beat a kind of a moralist namby-pamby unity. And of course, we all know Trump declared victory while votes are still being counted. And he's currently resorting to the Jim Crow tactic of disenfranchising black voters by calling for a stop to the count of the vote in multiple areas. So overall, we have a picture of a divided country and a political system with no legitimacy. Half the country views the other half not just as wrong, but as the enemy. Both parties have been calling into question the legitimacy of the election for weeks. Both parties have challenged the other party's presidential candidates for decades, from the impeachment of Clinton to the failed 2000 election, to the refusal to seat Obama's court nominees, to the impeachment of Trump. Now, no matter what happens, and it looks like Biden will edge past Trump in the next day or two, the oldest democracy in the world is very much like um, Joe Biden, enfeebled, decrepit, and senile, incapable of producing a government that can grapple with, much less solve, our enormous problems from COVID and the climate to the recession, economic inequality, and the looming mass evictions and homelessness. A Biden president will not mean that democracy has been saved. It will not mean a new time of national unity. More likely, it's the embittered um, Trump base is gonna feel like the election was stolen from them, um, particularly because they're convinced that Biden and Harris are socialists out to take their guns. The legal challenges that the Trump campaign is raising in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Georgia have audiences beyond the courts, right? The audience is also the far right, especially groups like those those involved in the planned kidnapping of the governor of Michigan last month. Now, some people like to talk about Trumpism. I actually have never thought that's a thing. And I think it was especially not a thing in this election because the campaign never offered a, co a coherent message or set of promises. Um, some wanna say that Trumpism is white supremacy plus Twitter. But that's not a political analysis that can account for why Trump did better with voters of color than any Republican presidential candidate in 60 years. Um, the group he did worst with in this election was white men. He lost more than 15 points from on his lead um, with white men from 2016. And Trump performed best with voters over 60, which is not the demographic typically associated with Twitter. So Twitter might explain how Trump kept himself at the heart of the media cycle for four years, but I don't think it explains the vote. What was interesting was the way that the Republicans and Democrats agreed on the fundamental issue of the campaign. And Vijay's already pointed to this, right? The coronavirus. Um, like I mentioned, those who supported Trump overwhelmingly approved of his handling of the virus. The Republican line was that the virus should not defeat us. We can't live in fear, but have to be free to work, earn, make that money, support our families. Shutdowns and masks from this approach are signs of weakness and defeat. The democratic message was that we have to get the virus under control, that the economy won't improve as long as the infection is raging. Now this is true, but the Democrats never offered a program for how people would live if they were fired or furloughed or their businesses closed down. It never offered the assurances of guaranteed health care. It didn't acknowledge the looming crises of evictions and foreclosures or the crisis of student debt. The democratic message was a combination of not Trump and back to normal. But normal in the US has included chattel slavery, apartheid, Jim Crow, and lynching. Normal has produced the largest carceral state in world history, not to mention imperialism, colonial extractivism, and so on. Normal has given us one of the few developed economies in the world that doesn't provide national health care. If Trump's normal was the 1950s, Biden's was likely either the 90s, a time of intensifying inequality and the birth of the tech titans, or the Obama administration, that is 2008 onward, the Great Recession and financial crisis. 
the Dems election strategy typically follows the demographics as destiny line, right? They, as, the elector, as the electorate becomes more diverse, the democratic base will expand. That the, lim that the candidate of white supremacy did better with black and Latino men than he did four years ago points to the limits of this identitarian strategy. People need to be given reasons. They need to be convinced. Identity does not determine politics. And the same holds for sexism. Although Trump um, lost with women as a whole, he won with white women. Just accusing him of racism and sexism is not a politics. Another element of so-called Trumpism is its authoritarianism or fascism. And this has been one of the main things that liberals have been screaming about for four years and why they could give the message that the message vote like your life depends on it unironically. Now, this is a false, misleading and deceptive message. It proceeds as if Trump alone were the source of authoritarianism in US politics, as if he were consistently lawless. But the problem is institutional, and, and Micah mentioned this. The police have been murdering unarmed Black people for over 100 years and consistently getting away with it. The appointment of Amy Comey Barrett to the Supreme Court a month before the election depended on the Senate especially the actions of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who refused to seat Obama's candidate in an, in an election year. The electoral college system, the right to request recounts, even the right to march around public spaces with guns is all fully legal and even normal. If Trumpism is a thing, then it is a response to the way that the opposition to the capitalist make that it's a response to the way that opposition to the capitalist uh, mainstream is completely excluded from the system. It's a response to the fact that the Democratic Party is not an opposition party, but a capitalist party, a party of the managerial, financial, and corporate elites. Crucial, I think it's crucial for the left as we go forward to recognize this oppositional element and find ways to connect with it. Now I'll close on an op optimistic note. The good thing about the political intensification brought about by Trump and the Democratic um, um, party's response to Trump is that it delegitimated the system to millions and millions of people. And this is a political opening for socialist. In down ballot elections, socialists are making inroads. Now, I don't think, I don't think anyone can reasonably think that there's an electoral road to socialism in the US. But nevertheless, these candidates amplify opportunities to repeat and expand calls for Medicare for all, Green New Deal, cancellation of student debt, and so on. And additionally, even as this election was actually really pretty good for the Republicans because they advanced in the House and seemed very close in the Senate, um, there were a whole slew of, of progressive ballot initiatives from the $15 minimum wage in Florida to the decriminalization of all drugs in Oregon and the legalization of marijuana in multiple states. And, and the, um, there's a 12 week um, paid provision for um, family and medical leave that passed in Colorado. Even more significant, in fact, the, and this is some of the points that Derrico was making, um, some of the most important political advances in 2020 were not, they had nothing to do with the election. They were about the hundreds of strikes in the initial months of the pandemic, the remarkable movement, the largest in US history, calling for justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, and so many others murdered by cops. Defund the police moved from being an abolitionist slogan to a mainstream demand what was possible and permissible changed significantly. The US political system, to use, a, uh, to use Lenin's expression, is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. The constitutional arrangements and the two-party system are structured to block real working class socialist and communist movement from political expression. This election, from the Democratic primaries that defeated Bernie Sanders to the uncertainty and contestation around counting the ballots makes this undeniably visible. The capacity of the political class to rule is fractured and weak and the capacities of the people to push back are growing by the day. Brilliant, thank you. Um, amazing contributions. I think what we'll do is, um, as being a very ultimate Democrat myself, is we'll open up to questions um, from from across the board. Now I know people have written stuff in the chat, so um, but I think we, you know, I like the idea that you should talk. So if you do want to ask a question, shall I call them out? Shall I start first? Who was first? I roll back. Um, okay, so. They're actually a, an organization rather than a person, but I know them. The Race Equality Network, whoever you are, 
He's represent. Do you want to ask your question? No. Okay. Maybe maybe we'll maybe I'll ask the question. I'll read it out for them. So um, the basic argument here, and it seems to go back to like, and we can open this up to the panel if we take this as the first question, is that the issue seems to be um, how do you deal with with different demographics who necessarily are are polarized in this way? And I think Derricka was trying to say that you could reform the polarization, right? That the polarization doesn't just have to be this kind of, um, let's say, left center left divide with a kind of right or right divide that you could reframe the polarization around concepts that we in this room would like, like justice, equality, and, uh, and maybe even socialism. Um, how do you do that when demographically, the US is so polarized? So for example, if you click as me and someone else were today on various states, and look at how they vote, it's quite scary, right? It's quite scary to see the blue and red divides in these um, in these states. So how how do you go about doing that? That would be a nice first question, I guess. Because you all allude to that? And then should we read out a couple more? Wow, some of these are not questions. They're 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 themselves papers. Let's take another one. Um, do, 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 do. Well, let's see if Nile. Uh... Nile Fort, do you want to yeah. ask your question? Sure, I get nervous in groups, but I'm going to kind of read it. Uh, so I, I basically wanted to know what you all think about the future of the Democratic Party in light of what, what we might call the left wing of the party. So I'm thinking about the squad. I'm thinking about the new members of the squad who are promoting ideas like the new Green Deal, canceling student debt, et cetera, et cetera. So, one, how do you think we can keep those issues on the agenda under a Biden presidency? And then Derricka talked about political double dutch. I want her to talk a little bit more about that. Says, she can talk about mm -hmm. how the Dream Defenders, BYP 100, mm -hmm. maybe I'm DSA good. are already doing that. That would be cool. Okay. And then I didn't put this in here, but Black people, of course, are captured by the Democratic Party. So for young Black Sorry, I think you're muted. Okay, I'm not sure yeah. what happened. I don't yeah, know sorry. Yeah. you heard. Can you repeat, sorry? The whole, the end not, or the Yeah, just the end, sorry. So young black activists have to figure out how to organize our parents, our grandparents, uh, our cousins who are familiar with the Democratic Party, which we're trapped in. How do we do that? How do we organize them? How do we push them to the left in a way that's not repulsive, but that also uh, deals with the reality that the Democratic Party has failed Black people over and over again? Okay, shall we, shall we take a round of answers to some of these before we, we forget the questions? <laughs> you just gotta unmute yourselves. Whoever wants to go first. Uh, all right, I'll say I'll say something to get the um, responses started. Um, um, even though the question was addressed to Derek, and I really um, want to hear a response, I want to take about up the question of the um, the um, organizing um, um, among um, Black people, particularly um, how younger Black people um, would can help organize their parents and grandparents. And um, I wanna use an example from Rochester, New York in the group um, Free the People Rock, who have been a really impressive organizing group against um, police violence. And they also have a whole slew of issues from cancel the rents, but, but particularly this summer, they've been organizing in really wonderful ways um, around police violence um, and justice for Daniel Prude. And one of the things that they always do is um, is in every one of their um, their events, they pay a kind of respect um, to their elders, and they talk and they express their appreciation for the generations that came before them. And I think that does a lot of that is a really strong community 
knitting um, activity. They also have a variety of different kinds of organizing strategies, right? From sometimes the um, the demo is going to be a you know face to face altercation with the police. Sometimes it's going to be a block party. Sometimes it's going to be community food sharing. So they have a, a bunch of strategies to try to bring out as many different people in the community as possible. And it's and then finally to wrap that up, I think one of the things that makes it so valuable is they're not constrained by are we talking about electoral politics and Democrats and Republicans. What they're doing is building a strong Black political force in Rochester, New York around a set of issues. And, and, and that's the frame, not who's a Democrat, who's a Republican. Yes, I can I can jump in really quickly. Niall actually should be on this panel. Niall is an incredible PhD student at Princeton University studying um, religion and African American studies under Eddie Glaw. He's a brilliant organizer and also my partner. So he's been super, super sweet by even answer <laughs> <laughs> question. But he probably has a lot to answer. I actually would be very curious about what he thinks because we haven't had to talk about this yet since so much has evolved. Um yeah, so two two quick things, and I think they may be responsive partially to what VJ said earlier than what Jody said in her comments. I know yesterday when I saw the graph float around online, that revealed some of the exit polls about how demographics showed out for Trump. I shared it because I was in such shock that the numbers, especially for Black men and women, increased. For Black men, it increased by like six points or seven points, and for Black women, it went from 4% to 8%. And I got um, a response that I think is very, very, very important, which, would, which is that Black people overwhelmingly voted via mail and that the exit polls reflect people who did in-person voting. And people who are more likely to vote in person were Republicans or Trump supporters. And so it's quite possible that even those demographic showings don't accurately reflect whether Black voting support, in fact, increased for Trump, which is which provided me some relief, but not pure relief because there's still numbers in some of the percent sign, but that's something I think is important to, to recognize. And to connect that to VJ's point earlier around the regional divide in the US and that people have to go there, people are in those places organizing you know, radically to get people to push them further to the left. So the Dream Defenders are an example, a wonderful example of that. If you look at one of the people who founded Dream Defenders, Phil Agnew, he and a bunch of other Black men launched Black Man Bill as an attempt to like encourage Black people, encourage Black men in particular to not you know, either sit the election out or to not um, vote for Donald Trump. This is one of the direct responses to that initial figure of Black men voting for that. You look at Dream Defenders, weeks before the election was people, pundits rather, were so confused about how Miami Day could go for, you know, Trump in the way that they did. I was talking to Rachel Gilmer, one of the, one of the current co-founder, the current um, co-director of Dream Defender. And she said, you know, we're up against people here who have fled socialist or communist countries who are very nervous about voting for Donald Trump. And so we're going to see all kinds of divisions um, in Florida over what the turnout is going to be. So then to watch MSNBC and they're scratching their head and like, wait, what? Latinos are different groups of people from different countries. They're just not one black of Hispanic voters. <laughs> Like black and brown organizers have known this for years and still relentlessly have been organizing in these deeply red states. You look at Action St. Louis organizing in St. Louis and Ferguson and the surrounding St. Louis counties. They're one of the reasons why Corey Bush is a new member of the squad. Look at what Southerners on New Ground is doing in Atlanta, what Project South is doing in Tennessee. There are lots of black and brown organizers on the left who are working diligently, not to just do electoral politics, but to shift the narrative around really radical and progressive ideas. They're also meeting the material needs of what people um what people are lacking in those spaces. So Dream Defenders, for example, is not have not only flipped prosecutor seats in Southern Florida and actually throughout the state because they have chapters in Pinellas County and I mean all throughout, but they also were doing COVID response. They also were setting up tents feeding people, right? So it, this, this deep experimentation with mutual aid and care, I mean, there's a long tradition of that, you know, mm -hmm. within, you know, these deeply red places. Now, what also has to happen is um, 
someone mentioned Sunrise and DSA, and I think this is exciting, but it's, it's not enough. There also needs to be really radical left multiracial spaces for white people to have political homes to do this work. That has to happen. Like that just has to happen because the doors of white supremacy, white supremacist organizations are always open. They're always recruiting. There's always a home for you here if you want to be a part of a gun toting organization, if you want to be a part of the Oath Keepers, if you want to be part of the Proud Boys. They have been organizing. So it's not that you know people on the left are organizing in a vacuum. We're also organizing against other people who are recruiting very angry white people who feel dispossessed because of the promises and the failure of, of neoliberalism. Right, and so in addition to people going into those spaces, there has to be more political homes for lots of different people to get involved. Cool, thank you. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Or is all taking it around the questions? Just, just very quickly, I, I just want to say that um, I think we need to recognize that yes, there's a big global problem for the left because you know, the left is not just about having the good ideas. The left is about organization, and our immediate and and um, proximate organizational form, the trade union, was eroded by globalization. I mean, we need to recognize that. Um, you know that around the world, uh, the disarticulation of production, the creation of a global supply chain, uh, this really weakened trade unionism as a force globally, not just in, in the United States or in the UK or, or here and there, but globally. And that was our proximate organizational form, the main organizational form of the left to build power in, in neighborhoods. The trade union was an educational institution. It was a mutual aid institution. You know, it played every, everything Derek just talked about it was what the trade union did. It would have fought to create humanity, you know, to defend the humanity of working class people. And the lack of trade unions uh, and lack of trade union power and, and, and the lack of trade union confidence comes from this objective fact. And I think we have to recognize that we can't just build a left with better arguments. Uh, we need to think what are the organizational forms to organize, not the petty bourgeois college students, but how to organize the working class. And I think that I want to just put that on the table because guys, in September, Pew did a survey and I mean, Pew surveys, okay, fine, polling data. I mean, let's all say it's all garbage, but Pew's survey from last year was really important. It said 61% of people in the United States thought income inequality was too much and something needed to be done about it. And guess what? The Democratic top of the ticket didn't run against income inequality. I mean, why didn't Biden just run against income inequality? Say that it's gone too far. We need to change things. You don't even have to advocate for socialism. Just advocate for some moderate form of lessening of income inequality. You've got 61% of the people who say it's a problem. That's more than a majority. Go on that, but they don't go on it. And it comes to that point. It's not just the objective side that's weak. In other words, you know, the organizational uh, strength of the working class is, is weak. It's not just that. Also, subjectively, uh, there's a fear of the argument um, that the left used to make. And the argument that the left used to make, I think we all agree, is still captivating because guess what? Whatever For whatever it's worth, polling data suggests that the left's argument still captures the imagination. The Bolsheviks didn't go to the people saying, help us make communism, let's make a... They went to the people with a slogan that said, peace, bread, and land. No war, we're going to feed everybody, and we're going to make sure we distribute land. I mean, this was, this was a slogan that actually reached into the hearts of people at the surface level. You didn't have to go deeper. Politics of the left now must hit on income inequality. That's the main issue, it seems to me. And, you know, erosion of health care and, and these, these issues that are right there on the surface. And, I mean, I think this is why when I look at, you know, I visited the office of the Dream Defenders, Derica, in, in Florida. Fabulous people, and they actually fight at the surface of reality. You know, they, they fight at the surface of reality, meaning, of course, 
anti police brutality but hunger as well and this is before the pandemic i mean hunger is a main issue where, where was biden talking about widespread hunger in the united states as a consequence of covid-19 i don't think he gave one speech about hunger you know how, how do you motivate a people where increasing numbers of people are going to bed hungry at night that has to be in any civilized society that should be the first demand you know of any political force is that people must be fed i'll just briefly say i mean vj was going in the direction i was going to go which is that when i am feeling down about living in the you know the imperial hegemon the most brutal and unequal power known to humanity uh, that is the united states uh and i think about how we're how we are ruled by all of these uh, minoritarian institutions and we have people like trump in the white house then i then i do remember that actually there isn't a real appetite despite all of the distortions of our politics that being the imperial hegemon and everything else creates there actually is a demonstrated appetite over and over and over again throughout the years for basic you know left wing policies i mean like Fox News ran a uh, again, you know, polls, whatever you can cite polls, say whatever you want. But Fox News ran a poll on election night that showed that 72 percent of the uh, the voters that they talked to, Fox News said that they wanted uh, Medicare for all. I mean, people are rightly disgusted by uh, income inequality. People, uh, you know, trade unions are more popular in the United States uh, according to, to uh, polls than they've been in a very long time. They're getting uh, more and more popular seemingly by the year as they as their power declines more and more. But there is a real appetite for these kind of policies in the United States. And Jody mentioned some of the things, you know, the the, the uh, ballot measures that passed. I mean, Florida went for Trump, yet somehow also voted for a $15 an hour minimum wage. I mean, uh, Oregon, uh, you know, voting to legalize uh, all forms of uh, drugs in small amounts. I mean, uh, th there's a real hunger out there. The problem is that those things are not on the ballot. The problem is that you have a, a Democratic Party politician. And you have a party that, that steadfastly refuses to, to think that that could ever, uh, that, that those popular things could be a, a way to win an election, which is a very interesting uh, understanding of how you win an election is you see what's popular and then you, you say, no, I'm not gonna do the popular thing. Uh, but so my, my, you know, what, what, what sort of makes me feel better about the bleak state of, of the United States is the fact that despite all of these, uh, all, all of these distortions, despite the rise of you know, bizarre reactionary right wing politics that we actually see that uh, and, and despite the fact we have this guy in the, in the White House who is, 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 you know, stoking the worst of that reactionary politics and that we have all of these these, you know, media and everything else that that, that we know exists to squash left wing politics that Americans still don't buy it on the whole, like the 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 most uh, rabid reactionary politics are still a minoritarian position in this country. Uh, so we, that that's a that's a very heartening a thing to to base our own uh, organizing off of that that uh, that it's not a country that is you know at the at the the, the ground level totally captured uh, by the right wing we we then which you know that's that is always the the, the socialist uh, argument right is that we our our policies actually um, would would benefit the vast majority of humanity and uh, when they're pitched to the vast majority of humanity the vast majority of humanity uh, will 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 support them and so. Uh, this, despite the fact that it is the, the U.S., that, that still seems to be the case right now. I know we need to get to the questions, but I, I want to just say one thing in response to um, Mike and BJ. So first, I, I agree with you both, um, particularly on equality, but I want to just mention two counter arguments to us, right, or to the claim that equality is the winning message um, or the strength of the left. And um, one of them comes from a friend of mine, Albana Asmanova, has a new book called Capital on Edge. And she argues that, you know, on the basis of all sorts of empirical data, that the left has been losing because we emphasize equality and a more winning message is precarity. That for the declined middle class and the newly immiserated um, working class by newly over the last 30 years, that equality they associate with deprivation and it doesn't address what they want, that rather, um, you know, addressing their precarity, eliminating their precarity is a more winning message. I don't know if I agree with this. I think there's a lot to figure out experiment experimentally as well as empirically. Um, I hate, I would hate to lose a message of equality, but I think it's an important counter. Another counter 
there's some on the left and right now I'm thinking of um, some Americans, um, Corey uh, Robin and Alex Garibut, who are emphasizing um, that the view that the that left politics in the US needs to focus much more on freedom and liberty, that those are the winning messages, particularly if we want to make inroads to um, the you know, um, furious, angry opposition that the Republicans are, have been able to capture, that we need to speak in terms of, of freedom and how the economic conditions that people are trapped in are unfreeing and that make equality you know, sort of subsidiary to that. So I just I, I think that we should keep should think about rather than just sort of accepting equality as our primary message that that there's some other options out there and that we need to grapple with. Okay. Um, thank you all for that. I'm going to take a massive round of questions, and what I'm going to do is we've got some names in the chat. If um, if I call your name forwards, please have a question. You can have a comment as well, but have a question and be brief. Um, as a Marxist, we always talk about dictatorship of the proletariat, so I'll be dictatorship of the chair and cut you off. So first up is John Lowry. Do you want to ask your question, John? No? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. Right. Thank you. Right, I just want to not so much raise a question, well, raise a question, but also a statement. I think for the socialist movement to raise, uh, to move forward, we need to address the question of what we mean by democracy, because all capitalist states are oligarchies. And somebody mentioned that 72% of the United States citizens would like to have Medicare. They then put that to a referendum, demand a referendum. Originally, Democracy meant the rule of the poor, and a democratic state, as Aristotle pointed out, was selected by lot. And that elections were, in fact, the mark of an oligarchy because the rich would always win because of their superior wealth. So I think we need to be looking at a real democracy where everything is put to a referendum and uh, elections are done away with and selection by lot to be brought in. Okay, that was that was really cool, Ambry. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we can come back to that. Um, Simon Berman. I hope I pronounced that right. Simon, are you still here? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my question was just I. Um, uh, I guess it was really um, spot off of some of the stuff that uh, Jody was saying, and. It does strike me that the, the thing about Trump that broke with uh, normal US politics or the normal violence, if you like, of the US ruling class was the pretty much outspoken alliance uh, between Trump and fascist groups like the Proud Boys, like these various, whatever they call them, these militia groups and so on. And this seemed to me uh, strikingly and qualitatively different. I mean, there have been fascistic, violent grassroots groups going back to the KKK, the militias of the 1990s, all the rest of it. But what I'm not aware of happening um, before, certainly not since the Civil War, is a US president openly trying to form an alliance, openly trying to encourage those groups. And that seemed to me, whilst I certainly wouldn't classify Trump as a fascist per se, or the Republican Party as a fascist organization, they were making an open alliance with fascist groups or at least he was. And I think that's something, and I, one of the things I also have a question about is to what extent is there any kind of organized or attempts to make organized opposition to that on the ground, to groups like the Proud Boys, uh, to these militias? Hey, thank you. Um, Miriam. Are you out there, Miriam? Or have you gone? Okay, I will move on. Albert, Alberto. Abelardo? Yes, sorry. Abelardo, yes. <laughs> sorry. Okay, hello, everybody. One small <laughs> comment and one question. Uh, I don't think the USA is especially a split society. 
I think all our societies are completely split. So I think, so I, I think uh, well, about, I don't know what's your comment. One uh, question, uh, what are, uh, to all the speakers, what are your international policy perspectives uh, if Biden wins? Why is my question? Because uh, the Democrats have always been more interventionist than the Republicans, which in some periods are relatively isolationists. And for Latin America, the Democrat uh, uh, party uh, governments have been really a mess. Uh -huh. uh, the Obama eight years administration was uh, really awful. Uh, the expulsion of migrants uh, didn't start with Trump. It started with Obama, the Mexican expulsion of the Mexican migrants expulsion. Uh, the illegal coups in Latin America were uh, organized, were tried in Latin America uh, during the Obama government. Remember Honduras, Paraguay, the attempts to overthrow uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Venezuela, and the, the jewel of the crown was Brazil, the coup against uh, Dilma. So that's my question. What do you think about the international perspectives of a Democrat party uh, win in relation of a, of a Trump re-election? Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant question. Um, Miriam, I see that you're back. So go for it. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm also busy doing some, not homeschooling, but just some something with, with my daughter. So, and in fact, I want to, um, I, I want to apologize if this question was already uh, responded to in the past 10 minutes or 15, because I was in and out. So my question relates to the fact that in the past few years, there has been an upsurge of uh, uh, extreme right-wing populism and right-wing movements in the US, but also we saw, uh, uh, we saw the left reorganizing and uh, um, diversifying its demands and its base, especially in terms of uh, the youth coming to the fore, expressing, uh, expressing anger in a much more organized uh, fashion that we haven't seen in, in ages. Um, so that has happened while uh, during the Trump administration, perhaps even more than the previous ones. So I would like to, to, to ask the panelists, how they interpret it, and how do they, th how they think that a Biden administration might influence, in a way or the other, the reorganization of the left, and what happened, especially on the ground uh, in uh, in recent years. Okay, thank. You. John, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. That is the phrase of the year, right? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we're going to take one more. And I think the next person up is Fu, Fu Wong. Oh, we can't hear you, Fu. No. Do you want to type your, your question in the chat and I'll read it out? Yeah, is that cool? If you type it in the chat, I'll read it out next. Um, the next person up is Hugh Good, Goodacre. Is that right? Hugh? Yes. Oh, shall I ask it then? Yes, please. Well, there's uh, been a kind of a, uh, assumption 
that um, if the Electoral College mathematics uh, works in favour of Biden, that Biden is going to be president. But uh, Trump has said he's not going to accept that, no matter what. And he has effectively militias almost, armed militias. Surely what happens now is that the issue goes to the streets, unless Trump suddenly mollifies. And the big questions on politics are going to be whether the senior army offices of the US uh, go for the Trump option or go against it or decide to get rid of him uh, and so on. All those things appear to be looming in the same way uh, as when Hitler was coming uh, to power. Uh, Trump has shown no respect for any of the existing institutions, uh, those that we might like and those that we might not like. So um, surely it's a bit rash just to assume that he's going to accept uh, what the Electoral College comes up with. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I can fit one more in, and I think that's Alex. Alex Kalinikos. Hi. Thanks, and thanks for a, a brilliant panel of, of speakers. My question is: uh, Should we talk about Trump more? Um, in a way, we've been talking about everything but Trump. But even if he doesn't win, and I don't think he'll be able to block the. Um, uh, um, Biden uh, constitutionally or anything like that. Even if he doesn't win, he's done pretty well. After all the messes he's created and all the people who've died from COVID, he's added five million to his vote. And therefore, I agree with Abelardo. This isn't simply a problem of a deeply divided country and gridlock politics and so on. That's been true to some extent for, for decades. What we're talking about is a kind of, uh, I, I regret to say, hegemonic politics that has been able to give a space for the far right, not simply on the streets, but in, to in terms of the larger, larger discourse, um, a much more central place to the far right in terms of politics. And this is going to have effects for a, a long time, given how well Trump has done, despite all his crassness and brutality and so on and so forth, they're going to be Im imitators. And therefore, I think that means that the challenge for the, for the left is one of constructing a hegemonic politics that can answer this kind of challenge. Because in a perverted sort of way, Trump has played on the politics of class immensely more successfully than people like Biden have been able to, for a very simple reason. Biden, you know, represents the Democratic Party that have sold themselves as good, humane managers of neoliberal, neoliberal capitalism. Trump has shown that you can partially uh, upend the system through playing the role of outsider, however fake and however uh, impregnated with the most revolting racism this may be. So the challenge is very big. How to construct uh, hegemonic politics for the left? And I, I can make one prediction. Very hard to do that within the confines of the Democratic Party. That's that's all. Okay, thank you. I think we've got... Wait, I'm trying to think who else is left. Maybe it's asked the last questions. Yeah, let's just take Luke... Luke Stolbart, we'll take your question. Hi. Um, yeah, actually, uh, Alex uh, has kind of partly an answered my question, but maybe the speakers could could add to it. Um, I, I um, suffer the, the ill fortune of being one of the few academics in Europe who shares an office with a, an academic who's an American Trump supporter, and uh, we had quite a big argument on our first day. Um, and he was pointing out that black and Latino support was growing because uh, Trump had delivered on certain issues. You know, some of his protectionist policies had brought back jobs um, that he hadn't kind of taken America into costly wars uh, with, with lots of Americans dying. And that basically that was where uh, the support came from. So I'd kind of like to know uh, if you could give me some new useful arguments when I have, have to sit in, in my office again with my colleague. <clears throat> okay, whether, whether um, there's any truth in this at all 
yeah <laughs> we're here to help everyone get over their issues today uh all right I, there's um i'm gonna one minute get some answers and then we're gonna go back round and food don't worry i see your question in the chat well that will be the first one of the next round so um yeah let's uh, speaker speak that's what i would say so whoever wants to go jump in Okay, I'll take a couple and then other people I think will jump in on other one on the, um, you know, the, the kind of how to deal with your office mate um, question. I, I think there's a way to say, um, you're right, the Democrats are a, a failed and opportunist party of the professional managerial class and it's no wonder that people don't like them and that, um, you know, that um, you, you office mate feel that Trump has delivered some things. I actually, I think that granting that and then trying to say, and yet, do you support the, um, you know, the tax cuts for the very rich? Is that the politics? Do you support family de um, deportations? Do you support, um, you know, the um, in ongoing, um, you know, oil exploration and drilling. If you don't support those things, then maybe you know there's another way that's not constrained by the Republicans and the Democrats. On the question of Trump saying he won't accept the results, I think that's a very interesting question, and we'll see what happens. What was fascinating um, early Wednesday morning is that when Trump um, kind of de semi declared victory or said that he had won, he got condemned by members of the Republican establishment. He didn't get any backup. And that seemed to be even his own vice president in that initial um, you know, announcement early in Wednesday morning did not share the same view. It, you know, Pence was a more, well, we'll see when the votes are counted. So I think that um, one of the things that we're seeing is that when the Republican establishment is not going around Trump, that his the his ability to um, to push his authoritarian line is 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 lessened substantially. Again, you know, we could maybe be wrong. I could be wrong on this. We might change over the next few days. I think there we'll see a lot more of the street game happening. But I don't think he's going to be able to get the kind of mind share that he needs. Um, and then the last one I want to take is about, well, wait a minute, isn't tr um, Trump's encouragement of right wing um, thugs and militias, isn't this something unique? And I want to say no, right? This is what American presidents have done throughout the Western Hemisphere for a century, right, is encouraging, um, you know, right wing thuggish movements um, that it's, you know, whether if you want to constrain it to the US rather than the other countries in the Western Hemisphere, you get a really distorted view of of the what the American system is like so I don't want to I don't think we should make it unique like oh no this is the first time he's done it it's it's the, it's business as usual okay Sh shall I talk about the well predictably shall I talk about foreign policy um, so uh, I'm just doing this because uh, I like doing it because the cover is beautiful. I've just written a book called Washington Bullets. It has a beautiful cover. It's a history of the CIA coups and assassinations. And let me tell you something. There is not one American president from George Washington onward who hasn't wanted to go and overthrow countries around the world in order to benefit American business and then recently capitalism in general. So let's not be naive about, you know, an American president, and it was extraordinarily naive for people to say, oh, look at Obama, he's so bad. It's not Obama, it's the American president. You put somebody in that Oval Office in this current structure, and the guy is going to drone the world on behalf of big business. You know, that, that's just a structural thing. Uh, Biden and Trump, there are some differences. So let me just rehearse a few of them. Well, firstly, the similarities. Today, um, the foreign minister of Iran, Javad Zarif, is in Caracas, and he's actually just right now at a public meeting with Jorge Arieza, the foreign minister of, of Venezuela, and they're having a meeting to strategize about this alliance against sanctions, because you know uh, Biden is going to keep the sanctions on. They're going to keep the sanctions on Cuba. He'll deepen the sanctions. A criminal criminal illegal sanctions on Venezuela. Um, the sanctions on, on Iran will continue. Um, and so I think there's no difference there. I, I jotted down, I said, oh my God, China. Uh, look, 
not one single ceo of a major silicon valley company has come out against trump's so called trade war because they all know that they are being defeated by chinese high tech companies in telecommunications in robotics etc they want help mercantilist help from the american government to use imperialist pressure to put huawei and zte back in the box so that you know these garbage companies like google which can't make the internet of all things uh, need you know the, your mother and father your ma bap sitting in washington dc to come and assist you in you know with putting the imperial finger on the scales with american cherche and things like that in south america uh, with the millennium challenge grant in 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 asia and so on you know this is not going to change uh, not one of these silicon valley firms has said trump's policy is out out of line you know because they see that last year the chinese scientists registered more patents than american scientists and eventually the quality of those patents will increase last year more chinese science uh, journals were published in peer reviewed journals than american this is a trend and they see the writing on the wall they would like their bombers and their warships to constrain china to maintain the us advantage and that biden is going to prosecute just just be clear about one thing trump is vulgar so he pushes people at the g20 to get in front of the photograph biden won't do that he'll be polite and nice same policy guys the one area of difference which is very misleading is on the paris climate change and on the iran nuclear deal it's very misleading don't for a minute assume that these are about the climate deal or about iran these are about cementing the us relationship with europe the united states policy establishment foreign imperialist establishment is very worried that trump has broken the nato united states alliance and has eroded the relationship with germany france and so on the it, democrats are going to want to normalize that back to let's say 2011 the climate negotiations in iran it's not about those two issues it's about bringing the europeans and the us back into harmony so that the europeans and us can walk together in the hybrid war against um, china particularly but also in all these conflicts and and, and let's face it okay bloody france you know it gets a clean pass on this the biggest imperialists in africa you know uh, out there whether it's the coup in mali uh, this election in ivory coast you know what shenanigans from macron when he goes to beirut after the the blast and so on you know the viceroy of the old french colonies uh, this is what the united the democratic party wants to be aligned with they want french imperialism and american imperialism to be lockstep forget british imperialism is a joke i mean it's basically uh, an ad addition uh, you know additional vote in the un for the united states uh, essentially great britain is not great anymore and it hasn't been independent in its foreign policy since 1945 whereas france has independence and they want france the united kingdom etc to be running lockstep so i don't think there's a great whole big difference between de democrats and republicans on foreign policy except strategically there is a difference and the strategic orientation the democrats will take is what will be called multilateralism but which is actually the old white supremacist imperialism europeans and united states together against the world what the chinese have been talking about multipolarity multilateralism it's nothing like what the dem it's a total different thing the chinese government has said publicly that we are not interested in in supplanting the united states we want to create a multilateral system um, it's a totally different thing on offer and i think there are lots of people around the world that are looking at that and saying it looks more attractive um, than having drones fly above our heads and hellfire missiles come and land on us or having arrogant people like emmanuel macron walk through the streets of beirut pretending that france is continuing its occupation of lebanon which in some sense it it is alongside the saudis and others so i mean i guess i just went on and on but what i wanted to say is these guys are just assholes when it comes to the rest of the world i, I thank you vj for for bookending that with the with the with the assholes bit um anyone else mike derica yeah i'll just say i oh, uh, i'll say i i, I agree with the Jay, and in fact, we now have, uh, assuming Biden wins, we will 
have uh, one of the principal assholes of the Democratic Party who played a key role in pushing us into uh, the war in Iraq. He, he played the central role of making the case to the Democrats uh, that, that we should invade Iraq. Um, so in, in some way, I mean, not to, not to overstate how, how, you know, how non-interventionist Trump was, that's, that, that's sometimes said on the left or, or among anybody in, in the United States. I don't think that's true, but, but Biden certainly has a more, a longer uh, history, a longer and more ignoble history of active uh, U.S. intervention uh, around the, the world. And of course he was, uh, as, as the initial question was about Latin America, you know, Biden was the vice president for uh, Obama when, uh, you know, we had things like the coup in, in Honduras. So, uh that is i mean that that should be a really top line item for this nascent american left is is uh watching what biden uh you know chooses to do or not do when it comes to u.s imperialism uh around around the world uh, on the question of opposition uh to the right and and the question about uh that we're, that we're perhaps not talking enough about trump i think that is probably correct um you know, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that I'm, I'm, I have a real worry. I have no idea what will, what, what this new permutations of this uh, reactionary politics will be in the years to come. I doubt that Trump will run again in four years, as some people are bringing. Who, his brain will be probably complete mush in four years, and it will. Uh, I think even even he will not be able to pull off another run. But the the, the sort of uh, bizarre and and terrifying forces that he has unleashed are real. Uh, are, are of, of a true terror to me uh, in, in the coming years. And I think that the, I mean, we already talked about how there is an actual base for some kinds of progressive uh, working class politics in, in this country. The way that the right has succeeded and how Democrats have played into their hands over the last few years is to turn everything into a kind of uh, culture war. Uh, and the, the Democrats have done nothing to move their politics away from that kind of uh, culture war, uh, you know, they, they, they've allowed even the, the, the lockdowns to become uh, a kind of culture war because precisely because they don't have anything else on offer besides this sort of like cultural affectation of like, well, personally, I believe scientists, perhaps you don't believe scientists, but I choose to believe the scientists. No actual uh, agenda, as we've already said, for how to actually provide for uh, an economic, uh, you know, economic relief for uh, Americans who are suffering in, in, in incredible ways during this uh, pandemic. It's just, it's, it's just more of the same of the culture war, which is the terrain of the right. That is the terrain that the right wants to fight on. That is the terrain that has brought Donald Trump to the presidency. Um, so uh, moving away from that kind of culture war is really the, the only hope I think that uh, the left has. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that is the, the argument that the left uh, is, is trying to make the actual left in the United States is trying to make. Um, but we don't have very many promising signs uh, that, that Biden and the Democrats at the top levels even understand that that is a problem, much less have anything to solve it. Erica? Yeah, I was trying to keep up with the questions. There were like 17,000 and I was able to keep track of, of some of them, but not all of them. And so I'm a little bit fearful. Um, the, the ones that I can recall that I didn't get to um, write down is the office mate. I think you should just fight him. I think you should physically fight this person. I think the conversation, <laughs> the civility, we, we, is, we are way past that. I think, yeah, I, I think that you should do that. I think there are a couple other things you can say, which is uh, Jody spoke to this. I completely, completely agree with that. There's a way to concede to that that doesn't concede to, to white supremacy. You can say, well, Black people have the right to be wrong. Sure, okay, like that, 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 like that's that's true. Like they, they have the right to be wrong. That doesn't give evidence. You also can respond and say, well, ninety percent of black people did not vote for Trump. Like that's also true, right? Um, you can also say, well, who is he running against? Well, he's running against someone who called Jesse Jackson a boy. He's running against someone who was one of the architects of the 90, 94 crime bill, right? You can say that Joe Biden supported segregation. You can say that Joe Biden told some of them that they weren't black. And so it's not as if he's running against Martin Luther King. It's, it's, there's the choices have been between someone who's a, a covert, perhaps even overt racist and a, a white nationalist. And so if, if people, particularly black people who chose to support Trump, neglected to see differences, then I mean, that says much more about, I think, Joe Biden than it does about, about Donald Trump. 
I think what's also unfortunate and just quite frustrating is the terrain upon which the conversation is, is had, you know, um, what's her name? Oh my gosh, what's her name? I think Andrea Smith, one of the founders of Critical Resistance, she has this this paper called the three pillars of like white supremacy or I'm heteropatriarchy. I can't remember the name of it, but basically one of the pillars is that because of the way that white supremacy is set up, it makes people of color and indigenous people um, negotiate on the grounds of white supremacy. And so for example, if, um, if what it means to be an American is to like go to war, if what it means to be an American means to own property, that's over and against like the indigenous claim to like land. And that's over against like imperial, imperialist practices in other countries. It's like, this is what it means. And so you're constantly figuring out where to be an American. So one way to be an American is to oppose people who are illegal and who are invaders and who are coming to take your job. And so if you are at the bottom of this capitalist pool and there are people you're competing against for labor purposes because of the American project, like that person then becomes your competition, not the person who's responsible for the exploitation and the conditions, right? And so it's unfortunate that, you know, lots of people in this country are susceptible to patriarchy, to xenophobia, to homophobia, to Islamophobia because of the kinds of conditions um, that reflect our federal government's policies, domestic and abroad. Even the electoral um, college is a project of concretizing internal borders, but that's a entirely other um, conversation. The white ring terrorist group that groups have popped up under Trump. I mean, they were first popping up under Obama because I think white people wanted to feel included in all of the pomp and circumstance and couldn't, they wanted to have their moment. And so what, what um, under the FBI actually, they have been tracking lots of explicit white supremacist group go and join the state sanctioned versions of white supremacist groups, which is the police. And so there have been a long track record of like these groups like coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. But as I said earlier, the lack of certain kinds of political homes to capture some of these people who, who VJ said will otherwise be a part of a, a trade union. Now being a part of the union and being part of an organized left community doesn't mean you're gonna be less racist. Right, but it probably means you're not gonna, you know, um, attack people in the way that we've seen white supremacists of the of the far right attack people. And then the not enough talking about Trump. I don't know what you want me to say. Like I, I feel like is there anything about Trump that has not really been said? Is he's been called a fascist? We've just been told his brain is gonna turn into mush in a few years. I don't know what's in between that that hasn't been said. One thing that I love from Angela Davis. And then she says, she told me this actually, she said, we have to stop asking the question, what if you know Trump doesn't leave office? And we have to start normalizing resistance and preparing to get him out. And I am much more excited about that conversation. Like, well, if this is the case, well, we have to just prepare for that. And in the US, as much as there has been imperial, imperial um, oppression and intervention in the other parts of the world, people of color here have formed deep solidarity and internationalist bonds with organizers in other places. And so I always love the stories of people who were enslaved, Black people who were enslaved, who were on Barbados, who found time to organize with the Irish to overthrow you know, the Britons who were there enslaving and exploiting both of them. There has always been some sort of way for us to also rely on internationalist whether sometimes, unfortunately, that, that means power. And I know that the, to, um, the terrain has shifted since the, the late 1600s, early 1700s. But I think that um, usually the foreign policy stuff is like, you know, other nation states. We also have to figure out people in the US how to examine and disrupt our own colonial relationships with places like Puerto Rico and Guam and the Virgin Islands, right? Because those are still colonial relationships that exist in 2020 that's responsible for so much expropriation, right? When I am reading Naomi Klein's work and she's warning us about the cryptocurrency tech people and why they need Puerto Rico to remain a colonial territory of the US is another form, another kind of form of capitalism that we have to fight even, you know, that's not like abroad in a particular sense, but that's right here. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like there were so many other questions that were asked, but like I said, those are the ones that I can, I can remember. No, don't worry. It was, uh, and if you tried reading the chat as well, that's another 
hole. Oh, true. Yeah, just don't even look at it. Um, no, don't. Uh, okay, and I think Trump's brain is already mush. So I think we can agree on that. All right, I'm going to do one quick more round because I've got the power. I can do it. Let's do it. Um, Kevin Wingfield, can you step up to the mic? If you're still here. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to say that um, what struck me most about what's been going on the last over the last few days is uh, the solidifying of uh, Trump's vote. I mean, I think it's it's important that, you know, we recognize, I think Alex said that, you know, three million or whatever it was, that there's, uh, it's gone up, uh, it hasn't gone down. And it seems to me that, uh, that the strategic problem for the left, for anybody who wants to change things, is how to get through to those people if we characterize much of that support for Trump as being people who are dispossessed in some way or another by the depredations of capitalism. Uh, they may not put it in those terms, but if that's what's happening to them and that's their response. And I think it's important, therefore, when people discussed here about, um, you know, uh, income inequality and Medicare and all the rest of the things which, which churn in enormous uh, 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 popular support in the opinion polls and so on, that, um, that, that the Democrats never take these up. And I think this is important because if we regard the left as being the Democrats, I know there's leftists in the Democrats, but if we could regard the Democrats as being the left and the Republicans as being the right, then I think we're snookered. I don't think there is a way in which a part of the structure of ruling America, which the Democratic Party is, of ruling capitalism in America, is going to be somehow part of the solution. It's part of the problem. And there needs to be a left, therefore, which can connect up with uh, with the real problems and begin to, somebody said about the project and so on of the left, the project of trying to get through to the masses of people, whether people of color, whites or what have you, who are, uh, you know, in some way uh, crushed and broken and hurt because of the, the, me, the, the way to which things in which capitalism. And I think just finally, that, that therefore the intensity of that of that uh, polarization, the intensity of that oppression and hurt which people are feeling is expressed in the way in which politics have got uglier and uglier. It's not that, 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 that the, those sorts of Trumpists like politics are sort of sui generis. They emerge from, the, it strikes me, the depth of the crisis of capitalism historically. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to take some rapid fire questions now, and that's that's your kind of gist for rapid fire, yeah. Um, Lucia, thank you. Well, I kind of wanted to echo what uh, Kevin said, and I think actually that um, this election, as far as I understand it, uh, shows that there is Trumpism, or from my point of view, what I I understand with trans Trumpism understood as a kind of anti-China, anti-immigrant, uh, protectionist, uh, and uh, fake uh, pro-workers uh, response to the crisis of the neoliberal consensus and uh, the, um, well, uh, US hegemony. And I think that, well, these election results show that uh, it's quite consolidated. So that's, that's a bit worrying. So I was wondering, since we talked about the importance of the trade unions and so on, I, I wanted to ask you on the other side, uh, to what extent uh, there have been and, uh, or synergies and to what extent they have consolidated between the kind of democratic socialist movement around Bernie Sanders, the Black Lives Matter movement, and how much they are able to talk to workers or those workers who are not unionized or uh, are part of the union movements. And if it's true that uh, many workers see the Democratic Party as part of the establishment, do you think that it it's actually helping uh, the advancement of the kind of opposition 
today that part of this movement is part of the Democratic Party? Or do you think this is kind of hindrance to the development of an anti-capitalist uh, internationalist movement in, in the US? Oh, thank you. Um, Leia, did you have a question in the chat? No, it's okay. They've been asked by other people. So I had actually a version of Abelardo's question, a version of Alex's question. So. Okay. Um, Sam? Um, my question is about strategy. So as we like sit in our organizations after this election, what is the timeline of change that we think about and based on which we organize? So before this election, a lot of the idea was, well, we vote for Biden, we advocate for Biden because he gives us more of an opportunity and time to push for leftist policies such as the Green New Deal to build the labor movement. And this sort of projects this idea that, okay, now we need eight years, whatever, 10 years, even 20 years to build the labor movement, to build the left coalition, and then we have the opportunity to bring about change. So my question is that, is this the way we should be thinking about strategy or we should be thinking more of a rupture, which would um, maybe a faster rupture, which would inform different strategy. And if we think of a longer term of building the labor movement, what does building a labor movement today mean? Because that's also very ambiguous to me. Um, yeah. I'll meet myself. Okay, uh, Johnny Wang and then Fu, don't worry. I have your question from the chat. It's amazing. It's gonna be the last one, okay? So Johnny Wang. Hi, can you hear me? So, so my question perhaps is a bit awkward, but I want to ask something about the um, stability. So from my point of view, just look at the US election. It seems whichever party of Democrats or Republicans wins, the other party supporters are not going to accept the result. So uh, that, 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 it, then this deepens the division between the, the division between like the, within, within the US society. And I think in, in the long term, this will destabilize the U.S. society as a whole. Whereas, and I think stability is the key for our society to, to function normally. And if we, put the, if we look at the global context, I mean, since, uh, like, ever since the 2008 financial crisis, uh, lots of problems emerged. And the divisions between left and right has deepened uh, over time. So I wonder, I just, I just wonder, how can we like restore the kind of stability and prosperity we had like before 2008? And how can we go back to the so-called normal path? Okay, thank you. I think you're gonna get pushback on going back to 208. Um, and just to bring, because I'm aware of the time, uh, Fu put this wonderful question in, in the chat where he said, uh, the emancipation of slaves three years after the Civil War changed the Civil War into a war of liberation. Biden is a one-term president of transition. What is the transition from what to what? And I think that might be a nice way if those panelists could, that could be the last thing that you consider, like, is this a transitory moment to something else? And if so, what is it? Yeah. So if we can just do the round of the panel and then we'll, we'll let everyone go. So I don't know who wants to go first. Micah, do you want to do you want to go first? Oh no, you're eating. That's unfair. <laughs> Sorry, Derica. Um, sure, I can. I can try. So stability. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I. I don't know if I'm interested in getting back to 2008. Um, I wouldn't say that 2008 was was stable. I would, yeah, I think that we were in the midst of an economic, on our way to an economic recession, which was one of the most unstable periods, um, at least for our, our economy. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure if Trump wins the Dems 
I don't know what would happen. I think that the Dems unfortunately will accept the result, but I don't, I don't think the people will. I think there will be lots of uprisings and resistance. I think unfortunately Nancy Pelosi will accept the results because the Democratic Party doesn't really have, um, what is it called? A spine. I don't, I don't think they would have the fight in them really to, to resist that. Just the same way the Democratic Party, I think again, Nancy Pelosi said that she will use every, every arrow. What was the quote? Every arrow in her, what's the thing arrows and carry? British quiver. But quiver, yes. Every arrow in her quiver. Um, but you see what happened. We have a new Supreme Court justice. And so I don't, I'm not sure how many arrows they have left in the quiver, but I do think that there will be significant uprisings in the streets. I think if Trump loses, I think he won't accept it, but I think that lots of other people will. Um, the synergies between DSA and Black Lives Matter, I think people are trying to figure that out. You know, DSA and Sunrise, I'm not saying them because I think of them as sort of sibling organizations that exploded in population around the same time. I think there's a lot of excitement for the possibilities of this group, but I, I can't remember who described this on this panel just now, that most of the, the membership are like young whitish college students, grad students. I think that's good, but I don't think that's enough. And I think that lots of organizations are trying to figure out, should there be, like, is the Afro-Socialist Caucus with NDSA, like, enough? Is it reflective enough? Is it um, representative of enough of, of, you know, people of color in the U.S. who are trying to organize towards a more liberatory project? The same with the Movement for Black Lives. The Movement for Black Lives is a coalition of mostly Black-led organizations, and they vary on their political, on their, like, economic commitments. And so I think that there is lots of synergies and, and opportunities, right? But what I've seen this summer, and I know because I'm an organizer and I've been in these classes, is that there are intentional attempts to build conceptual alignment al among a lot of these movements. So we're reading together, we're struggling together, we're arguing with each other in places that are not like in the streets, that are not on panels, that are not captured in the ways where people ask, you know, no one's talking about X, Y, Z. And I will literally in a strategy session where we're talking about that very, very thing. So I think that we should, and maybe this is related to the strategy question then, I don't know if a, an answer to like the strategy and the synergies is usually best offered by like a particular person on a panel because your strategy shouldn't be public. Like your strategy is what you do to get free. It, it, some of that stuff is extra legal. Some of that stuff, it's like um, experimental. Some, I mean, there's so many different ways that I know that that's happening because again, I'm a part of those conversations and I don't think there's just one way or one strategy. You know, people in the US are very, very different. What and I, and I think about this through the lens of abolition. Like sometimes people ask like, what's gonna happen when all the cops are gone and all the prisons are closed and the role to abolitionist futures are gonna require different sets of commitments and, and experimentations based on where we are. And the most important thing is that we have conceptual alignment, but that doesn't mean we need to have an aligned strategy. We just have to figure out what makes sense in the in the um, like where we are, and how do we have enough flexibility, flexibility and commitment to experimentation to figure out how to get there long term? And then the question about the emancipation of slaves and Biden is a one term president. I have hopes that Biden is a one term president. I am not. I am not sold that that's going to be the case. I'm very curious to hear what the other panelists have, um, what they think, but I'm not convinced that. Um, if that Biden is going to be a one-term president of transition. I think people will obviously want, you know, probably a, a progressive woman of color to run for office. Um, I think that depending on the person, I think that could be exciting, but it won't just be that. I think we're probably going to see many more wins at the local level of progressive, maybe DSA, Justice Dam sort of candidates. And I think that's exciting because even though we're not going to get socialism through an electoral process, um, I believe what Manny Maribel says, you know, we don't need to make everyone a socialist. We need to popularize socialism. And sometimes popularize socialism, you don't always use the socialist part. And so I'm very curious about what the fruits of those smaller elections are going to be. Oh, brilliant. Um, who's next? I can go next. Um, just to go a little bit off what Derek just said, I think that uh, what, what, what you mentioned about uh, the DSA and the working class, I think is, is true that the organization is wider than the American working class that doesn't reflect the, the sort of class composition of, of America. Is all true. Everybody who's involved in, in the organization would uh, 
would acknowledge that. Um, but I think there's a way that that's often talked about, which is like that uh, that the that the organization has that that, that, that well, let me rephrase this. The, there's a way that the composition of the American left is often talked about as if the left that we have today is not the product of like you know McCarthyism and the the severing of the link between the working class and the left that did exist at one time in the United States. Um, and uh, you know the part of the whole part of the Red Scare was about severing that link, right? It was and and weakening the left for the long term, which was it was successful to in doing. So I think that the the task is to try to uh, you know rebuild what was what was destroyed through uh, McCarthyism, which is certainly no no easy task. But I think that uh, people who are involved in this new socialist movement uh, understand that 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 like the composition of the movement as it exists is is not certainly not what, what, what we would need the left to look like. Um, and that, you know, Derek, you also mentioned that there are these really promising signs of like groups like, uh, you know, folks in the broad broad current of the Black Lives Matter movement being allied. I mean, I live in Chicago, like we have meetings with like Black Lives Matter and DSA and, and Sunrise people uh, coming together uh, in a way that is that I, that is extremely uh, heartening in a way that clearly understands that we, are, you know, these groups to, coming together are the kind of, uh, uh, what, what the nucleus of this new American left uh, has to look like. So I think that's very promising. Um, on just very briefly on the question of uh, the labor movement, um, to talk a little bit more about DSA. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the labor movement is, as folks probably know, is in really dire straits. And we all know what, uh, what awful effects that has on our, our politics as a whole. Uh, I think there's a, a significant current of people within uh, the DSA who have played key roles in big labor struggles in uh, recent years, whether it is uh, in uh, lots of teachers union fights, like in the Chicago Teachers Union uh, strikes of the last several years, whether it's as being organizers in the red state teacher strike wave uh, that took place in 2018, and in some ways is still ongoing, or at least still has some of that energy still present in teachers union organizing. Um, I, think, I think a lot of, uh, a, a significant current of socialists understand uh, that, you know, not just that the labor movement is important, but that socialists have to be embedded within uh, shop floors and within the labor movement uh, around the country and to play a role in revitalizing it. And so uh, that's that's happening uh, in some, uh, you know, nascent, again, uh, small, again, but important ways. Um, and then on the question of the transition from what to what, the, the, the most, maybe the most interesting question uh, uh, that's been put forward today, I would say uh, that, you know, Joe Biden has explicitly called himself a, a transition candidate, but uh, I think he may just mean the transition of, you know, the baton being handed as he, as he you know, falls off the map to uh, a new generation of, of, of politicians like uh, Kamala Harris. Who, who don't substantively represent a different agenda than what Joe Biden, uh, that do, Joe Biden does. So I don't think that, uh, I, I think that when, when the kind of transition that he has in mind is not much of a transition uh, at all. And I don't think, you know, I don't think that this election itself it represents much of a, a transition, maybe a kind of like, you know, steering a car away from the, from the brink of disaster at the last minute um, in terms of not reelecting somebody who's and all the awful things we've been talking about, but I, I don't think there has been there's there's not a substantive transition uh, yet that, that we've seen that we that we're going to see from from this uh, election. Obviously, I hope for a substantive transition at some point, uh, but this wasn't the election in which that happened. We have like a, a kind of the, the what I think at this point is a clear uh, bankruptcy of neoliberalism in the 21st century. Uh, you know, Trump's election in a perverse way kind of reflects that. Uh, we we chose to go to the uh, the, the more openly neoliberal, like you know, the good old classical centrist neoliberal Joe uh, for the next four years at least. Uh, but I don't think that means that that neoliberalism's legitimacy has somehow been uh, rebuilt. And so I think we're we're all expecting some kind of transition to happen in the near future. But this election was not it. Okay. Jody? I'll, go, I'll go next so that BJ has the last word because I think he'll be much more enthusiastic and, and, and inspiring. Um, so I want to address sort of three points, the kind of labor question, the transition and organizing. Um, so on the, on the 
Yeah, and the question of, of labor organizing and workers. I, mean, I think one of the problems in the US is that the, uh, the working class in the US is not a society of producers. It's not, I mean, the 80, per, uh, so out of the non-farm, uh, non-agricultural workers, part of the organized work, uh, part of the workforce in the US, 80% or a little over 80% are in the service sector, right? That's where the majority, uh, the vast majority of positions are right now. The service sector expands from you know low income, precarious, uh, flexible labor to you know more high paid um, you know, lawyers, insurance, real estate people. But it's not a society of produce. It's not like they're not. It's not productive labor in the sense that we're used to talking about. And I think this. I think that this is also part of the problem for or get for people thinking about themselves as workers in a way that seems positive and inspiring, right? The, the jobs that are most, pro that are, are predicted to have the highest number of new positions in the next five years are home health care workers and retail, essentially forms of servants, right? We're moving, we've moved into a society where productive labor is not the primary model for workers. And I think um, that you know that socialist and communist have to figure out ways of working with this. Like, what does this mean for our organizing? Because it's hard to say, you know, all power to the real estate agents. Like, or that's that's a terrible. Like, that just doesn't seem like an inspiring thing. Additionally, on this problem with, um, you know with imagining oneself as a worker in this setting. And one of the worst of the ballot initiatives that was passed was Prop 22 in California. And it was um, over, over $200 million was spent by platforms like Uber and Lyft to push an, a, a provision that would say that all drivers are independent contractors, not workers. This was eviscerating the kinds of support they would have had if they'd been classified as employees of this company, um, essentially making them utterly dependent on the market. Um, and it was a con highly contested. It, was, it didn't pass by a huge margin. But what it meant, I think, um, was that it was people preferred to imagine themselves as independent contractors, as entrepreneurs, rather than as workers, right? They didn't want to be employees and recognize their dependence on the companies, on, on the platforms. They'd rather think of themselves as independent. And of course, this hides their dependence on the market. So I think we've got, we've, with the, the, the contemporary left has to, particularly in these um, primarily service sector economies, has got to think about what this means for organizing as labor. Um, second, on transition. Um, I think that this is going to be a matter uh, of scale, like what are we looking at, like just looking at the White House isn't going to tell us very much. Um, I think, um, yeah, um, um, Derek pointed us to looking much more at um, lower, you know, down ballot elections and, and also the movements. And so I think also thinking about how the organized movement shapes, that's going to determine a lot about what the you know the so-called transition looks like. It's not fixed, right? It's not determined. The organized actions of people are gonna make the difference there. Um, and that's gonna be the organized actions of people um, on the right and the left, right? It's gonna be the struggles. So I think it's gonna be a matter of the struggles. And then uh, finally, this goes to the question then of organizing. And Vijay was right to make us think about, okay, like what would be our equivalent of, of peace, bread and land? Um, and I, I think that that might be um, depend on different countries, different, even different parts of the country, what's going to be the most compelling, but it does require a set of material convictions. And I've wondered abstractly if a kind of frame that's like the demand is like, I mean, the, the way of framing it would be like, you have a future if we have a future that it's it tries to get rid of the individualism which is so pervasive in the US like i think in the US peace bread and land wouldn't completely work not just because people are militarist and don't want peace but because they're so deeply skeptical of anything that comes from the government or that's collective and so something that says look you're you're you you already accept or believe that your future is going to be worse that your kids' lives are going to be worse, right? That's widespread um, from millennials and younger. And so if a, a way that says, look, you can have a future, you will have a future if we have a future and start to reframe in a more collective way. So that's, um, yeah, that would be my response on the um, thinking about workers, thinking about transition and thinking about organizing. Thank you. That was brilliant. Um, BJ, take us home. Well, 
Firstly, I don't know anything about being inspirational in this day, in this context, Jody. So that was a little unfair, I must say. I'm, I registered a public complaint. Uh, it's too difficult to be inspirational because, Jody, in this election, if Trump wins Nevada, three states, Montana, South Dakota, and Nevada, would have elected Trump and legalized marijuana. And this is a confounding thing. Um, you know, Micah is too polite. He doesn't come out directly and say magic mushrooms. But many of these states legalized magic mushrooms. Uh, there's something here to look at. The Libertarian Party had its biggest gain. Okay, it only got a little over a percent of the vote. But uh, I, I was looking at the numbers. They won 1.6 million votes. The Libertarian Party in the United States, before we began, I mentioned the vice presidential candidate, he is all for mandatory toothbrushing. Um, they have a lot of very strange policies, but they have 650,000 members, paid up members. Now, I'm saying this because the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, had an extraordinary surge of membership. Their membership, Micah, I may be wrong in this, Jody, you, you may know better, but it's something in the range of 70,000 members. The DSA membership with a big surge is at 70,000 members. The libertarian membership is 650,000. This is the context that we have to look at. You know, we, we, you've got to look at the context of the left in terms of this other critical movement, this deeply individualistic Ayn Rand-esque movement, what Jody was just talking about. This plays a major role in American culture, and it has made a big impact on negative impact on trade unionism. I'm just going to give you a comparison. When COVID-19 struck in the state of Kerala in India, a state governed by the left, no doubt about that. But the trade unions in the state and the cooperative movements immediately took public action. I'll give you one example. The trade union movement came to bus stands. And because trade union, well, there are many of them are people with various productive skills, they built sinks in public so that as people got off buses, they could wash their hands because WHO immediately was saying, wash your hands, wear masks and so on. They built sinks and they came out there and started feeding people on the streets, built street kitchens and things like that. The capacity of unions to do public action in various parts of the world where left culture hasn't deteriorated is considerable and we shouldn't forget that. It's wrong. I, I dislike how people say, well, unions do this, unions do that. Different parts of the world, left culture are in different states of repair and disrepair. In Kerala, the left culture is not in disrepair. This is what we saw tangibly in Kerala during this period. In the United States, unions made a terrible mistake about maybe 20 years ago when Andy Stern and people like him decided use union money not to go out there and do social unionism. You know, make sure people are fed, make sure that union workers are on the streets, becoming like a community organization. Rather than do all that, let's put our money into the Democratic Party. That That's a choice that the union leadership made under, I've forgotten his name, John Wilhelm of HERE, uh, Andy Stern, people like that. They decided to take hard money from working class people. Now I think union membership is, I don't know, you guys, what's it, 15 million, 16 million, something like that. It's, it's very much eroded. Union member money going to elect Democrats. Why not going to develop um, organizational capacity in working class areas so that when a COVID pandemic happens, union members are on the street, out there feeding people, building sinks, making masks in their homes, distributing it as an organized collective force of the working class, whether productive workers or non-productive workers. The culture of the left is just not there in these organizations. I think that's where you have to make the argument uh, with the DSA as well, where mutual help is the term the DSA is using. And I mean, I'm afraid that's okay. That's a fine word and so on. But we're talking about the culture of the left. We're not talking about mutual aid. Mutual aid is just one piece of a much broader cultural thing. It's about thinking, as Jody just said, not as individuals, but as collectivities, as communities, as people who have to learn to love each other, not be scared of each other. I mean, one of the ways in which Liberals came into this COVID pandemic was stay at home. And they used a ridiculous slogan, which was social distancing. I hate that slogan. In Kerala, the left said, we reject the slogan. And they used the slogan, 
physical distancing social solidarity you see how different that is physical distance six feet but social solidarity not social distancing you know it, it reflects something of the cultural corrosion of liberals that they can't see that their slogans are so inappropriate to the construction of beautiful communities precious lives taken care of and so on we're just not there you know we're not there so it's great that the dsa is growing it's really incredible and and it's super to see people out there you know attacking the brutality of the police but we need much more i mean we've got to build communities of the left cultures of the left and that's just not happening i don't even see seeds of that happening you know i i don't even see seeds of that this is a protect, protracted struggle you know we can talk about is Biden transition, this is all in the short term. I mean, in a sense, the combined collective left has to have a much longer trajectory of thinking. You know, it's got to be like a 20 year project, how to come back in 20 years. You're not going to come back. And that's what happens to the left. Every four or five years, you've got to go behind the Democrats. And that becomes the political strategy. That's not politics, that's electoralism. You need a political strategy that's 20, 30 years out. And when you have a political strategy, every four years you do your electoral thing, but don't take that too seriously. You've got to think in that long term. And until the left does that, and by the way, this is friendly advice to the United Kingdom as well. Uh, you need a long-term strategy. You know, it can't devolve to electoralism because if it's electoralism, then it's what comrades have warned about. You, you know, it's the Democratic Party and so on. Nobody on the left in the United States believes the Democratic Party is the vehicle of the left. N not even the DSA people who run on the Democratic Party line. Let me just tell you, because I've interviewed lots of them who just won elections. They don't believe the Democratic Party is the vehicle to socialism. Please, let, let's not let's not be let's not throw mud at them they are very smart they are playing a long game i have the highest respect for these people in the squad we may disagree on the green new deal or whatever i have the highest respect for the long game they are playing they know exactly what they're doing you know sniping from the margins at people like that without understanding the game they're playing let me tell you something get your feet wet before you criticize people too swiftly Okay, thank you, VJ. Um, I, 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 we could go on forever, but let's not. Um, let's let's kind of hope that things resolve themselves. I think one of the biggest issues that came out of this conversation is is probably less a focus on Trump and more a kind of focus on 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 what is left in that is always the people, and hope is with those people. And we, we, I think we've excavated that the people, there is hope in the people, if we can go out and do the hard work together, including in the UK, VJ, where we need a lot of work, believe me. Uh, and no one believes that the Labour Party is a vehicle for socialism here anymore. Um, Lucia, do you have anything to say before we go? Other than that, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being brilliant on the panel. We love you all. Keep safe out there. And thank don't social distance. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.